thank you for giving me this chance. Um, I don't normally give speeches. In fact, this is my very first speech in front of a real audience. And uh, but I was specifically thrilled when um, you know Satya Sai University called me, and they said, uh, "Why don't you come here and give a speech in Bangalore?" And it was a great pleasure for me to come to Bangalore because I because I live in Chennai now. Um, you guys don't know how lucky you all are to live in the state of Karnataka. You guys are really, really lucky because you have some of the most spectacular temples in India. Uh, the Chenna Keshava, um, the Amruteshwara temples, um, you have uh, Vijayanagara style temples around Hampi, you have Virupaksha temples, Vitala temples, which is famous for the musical pillars. And you also have cave temples um, like Badami Caves, which is a monolithic architecture, usually carved out of one stone. These are all actually miracles. Uh, most people don't understand that these temples are real miracles until they go out of India. We underestimate them because we all live in India. But I understood the power of the temples. Once I moved to the United States, I lived in the United States for 15 years. And then I went around a lot of other countries. I went to Colombia, um, went to Cambodia, Mexico. I traveled around the Caribbean. I went to South America, uh, going to countries like Peru. And then I realized the temples of India are truly extraordinary, okay? They're really unmatched. So in that way, especially for all of you to live in this area in Bangalore, I think it's 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 somehow you guys are really lucky. So that's why I, I um, you know, I said, okay, let me um, give my first speech here about the temples. Now, the topic I've chosen uh, is the science behind temples and it's really interesting to put them like this when you say science and religion side by side because it almost seems like it doesn't belong together because uh, in the outside world people consider science as a separate issue and religion as a separate issue sometimes they're even seen conflicting one another it may be true of other religions but hinduism is so old that it had to grow up with science. It had no choice. In Hinduism, we took objects and beings from the nature and we made them into gods. For example, you can say the sun god, the Surya Bhagavan. We all know that the sun is a giant ball of fire, but we have decided to worship it as a god. And you can say Hindus worship the sun as a god, but not only Hindus worship and celebrate the sun, around the world, people celebrate and worship the sun. They don't have a choice because sun is considered a real natural God. And this may be a conflicting theory for you, right? How can you say this, right? So there can be a Christian, there can be a Muslim, there can even secretly be an atheist somewhere here. <laughs> we don't know that, right? It's, it's okay. But let's say if somebody is an atheist or a Muslim or Hindu or a Christian, they say, I don't worship the sun. I don't celebrate the sun. It has nothing to do with me. That's not true. Because let's say, what is your birthday? So your birthday, September 29th. So why does he celebrate September 29th every year? Why can't he celebrate his birthday every month? right? Or every week or every six months. Why does he have to do it only on September 29th every year? He's basically marking the position of him respective to the sun every year. So when he was born on September 29th, he makes one full circle around the sun and then he chooses to celebrate that as his birthday. And this is all personal to all of you, but think about a new year, right? January First, everybody is going crazy. All of you are sending messages. Who knows what you guys are doing? All the young guys at in the midnight, we don't know, right? But why? 
right? Think about it. Why is the whole world lighting up on January 1st? Think about some alien watching the earth, right? Far away and saying, what are these people doing on this one day? We are basically worshiping and celebrating Earth's one full circle to the sun, right? That's all we are doing. We are basically worshiping and celebrating sun. Th this is the actual science behind Hinduism. And there used to be many ancient cultures around the world which were based on this scientific dharma. For example, the ancient Egyptians did the same. The ancient Greeks worshiped all the, the solar events like equinox and solstice, but they're all gone, okay? No, Egypt has completely become an Islamic uh, country now. Greek has completely become a Christian country or a secular country. But the point is nobody worships the Egyptian gods Ra, okay? Nobody's worshiping the Greek gods Thor right? They've all become superheroes in Avengers movies, right? They're actual gods from the Greek quote-unquote mythology. But India is the last bastion, right? India is the last stronghold of this ancient civilization. We are the only ones who are still worshiping Ganesha, who are still worshiping Shiva, who are still worshiping Surya. And we don't want to let this thing go extinct. In fact, we want it to revive because it's based on science. Okay, so what we did was we took the sun and we personified it as Surya Bhagwan, and we started to build a temple for Surya Bhagwan or build temples for other gods. And then we started to put the symbols, the scientific symbols in the temples. That's how it started. Okay, now why were the temples built? If if some of you, if some of you ask that question, right? If if uh, two guys are sitting next to each other and say, "I want to build a temple," and somebody says, "Why are you building a temple?" It seems like a meaningless question today. It seems like, why do you build a hospital, right, to cure patients? Why do you build a movie theater to watch movies? So the object of building a temple is to worship gods, right? But when you go and visit ancient temples, you're going to completely change this perspective. Because the temple, and I'm very glad I've come to this place because uh, he was giving me, he's, he's hiding there somewhere. He was giving me a tour of this place. And you guys can understand this fully because this, this models the ancient temples. The ancient temple was built with multi-purpose in mind, okay? When you enter the temple, you're going to see a specific place called Natya Mandaba. That's a dance hall. You're going to see a specific place that's a kitchen that's giving free food to all the people. You're going to see a specific place that's called Kalyana Mandaba, which is a, a wedding hall where people you know, get married. And then uh, when we see inscriptions, we find play, uh, words like Adura Shala, that means hospitals. They were having separate places for healing the sick in the temple. So the temples were built with like a multi-purpose in their in their minds. Okay, so this is this is one of the one of the things that they had in mind. And sometimes, and and it's really cool that I've come to this place because when they showed me around this campus, I could feel the same idea behind that. They were showing me the hospitals, the learning places. It's really fantastic. I'm glad that we're able to keep the tradition flowing, right, for more than 2,000 years in this way, okay? And sometimes, because I live in Chennai, sometimes people come and contact me and they say, we want to build a small little temple. And they will show me, quote unquote, business plan to build a temple. And they will tell me something interesting, like, we want to find a prime location. We want to, we want to find a place that's in the center of the city to build a temple, okay? But again, when we go back to ancient builders, we see something completely different. We see what they're doing is just a bunch of ancient builders going into the middle of the forest, right? Clearing all the trees and start building a temple, a, a giant temple in the middle of nowhere, 
It's, it used to be in the middle of nowhere. That's where most of the temples were started. And then the very first settlers are, were the priests around the temple. The Pujaris started their building their houses. And then slowly, 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 the temple started to attract a lot of people. Okay, and then the city was literally formed around the temple. So I've surveyed several temple cities like this, and it's interesting because the oldest structure in the city is the temple, and the temple is exactly in the center of the city. That means the temple was built first, and the city slowly developed around this. So you created they would go from one place to another. They would choose a completely barren land. They would build a temple and then they would create a new city. After that, their job is finished. Now the ancient builders went to another place. This is how the, the civilization started to, to spring up everywhere. So we, we can see this. And when we look at the carvings, today, if you go to modern temples, if you look at the bottom of the temple, um, there are not many carvings. If you look at the the first two feet of the temple's base, there are not many carvings. They're usually like blank. But when you go to ancient temples, if you go to, for example, the Hoysalisra temples or any other temples, even in Hampi, you will always see animals carved there. And not just some row of animals, right? You know, we're not just going to see maybe like lions or elephants or something like that. You will see interesting information. You will see, for example, an elephant drinking milk from its mother. Nobody, nobody probably has seen that, but elephants do that. And then you will see a monkey trying to open a jackfruit, okay? And it doesn't belong in temples, right? Today, if, if somebody says, let me carve this in a temple, it, you will feel like, what is the connection between this and gods? There is no connection between that. But it turns out that there was a system in which they built the temple in a vertical fashion, okay? So they arrange it according to the age. So if you're, let's say, somebody is five years old, all you're going to look at is those carvings at the bottom. And the children are naturally interested in that, right? That is their animal planet or the cartoon network they're going to watch. So from age group between zero to five, that was the level and that's where you see all the animals. From the age group between six and 10, you will see a lot of uh, dancing. You will see a lot of fighting like wrestling, sometimes even boxing. You will see games like tug of war. This is what they're naturally interested in. And between age group from 11 to 15, you actually start seeing astronomical information. And this is where we find the sundials. Okay, and you may, you may have seen this. Um, I have already shown a few sundials in, in temples. Okay, but there are many hidden. Um, you will, and some of you may have thought, um, because we talked about the Surya Bhagavan, right? The standard statue of ancient Surya Dev is Surya Bhagavan is standing there in a chariot, and he will have seven horses, okay? Nobody knows why he has seven horses. At least today, nobody knows why he has seven horses. But ancient texts and ancient temples show that the seven horses were of different colors. And only maybe 200, 300 years ago, Isaac Newton discovered that sunlight can be split into seven different colors. Now, we don't know how ancient people were aware of that. So there are many secret codes like this hidden in ancient temples, okay? So for that age group between 11 to 15, you'll see scientific information, you will see uh, astronomy, and you will see like valuable science, like how to make knots. Uh, in one of my videos, I've shown probably 30 different types of knot making. And these knots are really useful. You know, they, these are life skills and they're all carved in temples. And between 16 to uh, 20, you're going to look at carvings related to politics, war, administration. And between 21 to 25, you see erotica, which is like love making, you know, family, uh, pregnancy type of carvings. 
Only beyond that level, you see the gods. They don't go straight to the gods. And I'm sure many of you wondered, why do they have these carvings in these temples? Because they had a system where they could, you know, categorize people and say, okay, these people are going to watch this. So if you, you're supposed to get past all the levels before you reach the gods. So this was the idea behind having, you know, the, the, the temples. Okay. And then we talked about why the temples were built. Um, we want to talk about how the temples were built. Um, how the temples were built, if you, I'm, I'm sure um, there's some history professor, he's a, you know, archaeology history professor, so their students also may have been there. The standard idea behind building a temple is, even when I told you ancient builders went there, they built temples, you're all imagining people taking chisels, hammers, spades, crowbars, you know, th this is the standard thought process that we think of. But time and time again, we see evidence of very advanced technology in ancient temples. Um, we don't know how they were able to build these extraordinary temples. Uh, for example, in uh, Chennakeshava temple, in all of Hoysala belt and some Chalukya temples now I hear, um, the pillars are made of lathe technology. If you look at the pillars, the pillars look almost perfectly circular and they have these curves, okay? These cannot be made with chisels and hammers. These can be made only using rotating mechanisms. And, and, and of course, experts agree that yes, these can be made only with rotating mechanisms, but we don't know what kind of rotating mechanisms they use. Okay, so this is one evidence of advanced technology. And again, in Hoysaleshwara temple, if you go there, um, there is a main idol and around the, on two sides of the main idol, you'll see two guardians. Okay, these are called Dwarapalakas, you know this. These are called Dwarapalakas, you know this. These are really dark structures, gigantic structures, about seven feet tall. And the Dwarapalakas are very ornate, okay? And in their crowns, you will have skulls about this size. And the skulls have holes for their eyes, mouth, and ears. So what I did was I took a small twig, like a, you know, like a thread, and then I put it in the ear. And it would come out through the other ear. And I would put it through the mouth and I could pull it out through the eyes. So that means, and we're talking about this size of stone, guys. This is about less than a, one inch, okay? So that means that entire ball is completely hollow, made with holes of different sizes. So imagine how people were doing that thousand years ago with primitive tools. Just imagine how you can, you can create that, okay, using that. And then in, in, in Brihadisura temple, you'll find temples made of granite. This is soapstone. This is a little bit of a softer stone in Hoysala Bal. In Brihadisura temple, we see temples made of granite, right? The, the blocks are made of granite. It's one of the hardest rocks in the world. And then again, you find these tiny holes and these holes are made in almost a 90 degree angle. So if you take a, a, a flexible stick and then you put it through one hole, it'll come out 90 degrees outside. So we don't know how they were making this and we don't understand the technology behind this, okay? So um, another one, th this is uh, some evidence of machining technology. For example, in these Hoysalis uh, pillars, as he knows, he, uh, he's actually researching on this. Experts agree that yes, we cannot do this with chisels and hammers. We used a rotating mechanism but we don't know what rotating mechanism they used. So now when we use late machines, we use advanced mechanical devices, we use CNC machines, uh, we use our regular late machines, but we don't know what kind they use, but now archeologists and historians kind of reverse engineer that. They'd be like, what could they have used? Could they have used elephants? Could they have used horses to rotate really fast? They're trying to kind of reverse engineer that. Okay, another technology uh, 
I found in um, was in Ramapa Temple. There is one temple called the Ramapa Temple. Uh, this is near Warangal. This is in uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, Telangana. This is in Telangana. Now, if you go to this temple, the stone blocks were made of a very unique material. They look normal. The, the stone blocks look like bricks, okay? But if you take the brick from the temple and if you put it in water, it just floats, okay? It's unnatural. If you take the brick and if you put it in water, it floats. It's not supposed to float. And some of you may have noticed that, some of you know there is a specific rock called pumice or pumice. It's a very porous rock, it's natu it naturally floats. It's not this pumice rock. They have manufactured artificial stones to make it specifically lightweight. We don't know how they did it. Uh, believe it or not, today we use the same technology. We use something called AAC or autoclaved aerated concrete. So they take some concrete, they put some foam inside, they pump the foam inside, and they put very lightweight material like hay. They put it, so they specifically make it light. It, it's very light. Again, you can throw this block in water and it just floats. Okay, today we use AAC blocks. But why do they use these AAC blocks? It's very famous in Japan. These AAC blocks are very famous in Japan because if the building becomes really heavy, right? It will not withstand the earthquake. It will just completely collapse. It's better to have very lightweight stone blocks in earthquake prone zones, okay? And when I went into the Ramapa temple, guys, I, because I found the stone blocks around the Warangal gate area, this is about 20 miles. I made the samples, I was testing it. Then when we went into the Ramapa temple, I was shocked because inside the Ramapa temple, you can see actual evidence of earthquake. The, but the temple is not collapsed. So when you walk into the, when you're like coming from the outside, the temple looks like a normal intact temple. But when I enter, entered the temple, I was shocked by this because the, the structure looks like this, it's bent. A massive earthquake had hit that area maybe 500, 700 years ago. It was so massive that all the houses and all the government buildings at that time, you know, back when the kings were ruling, they're all gone. But the temple survived. So they were masters. So think about the brain behind making a temple like that. So they expected an earthquake to happen. Then they knew how to beat the earthquake a thousand years ago. And this is the you know, you had to have that kind of knowledge. We still don't have this kind of prediction. We, we still don't sometimes, I mean, when we measure, you know, uh, when we try to build a room, it's really funny because we cannot make right angles. <laughs> Usually there's one, one place that's messed up. So this kind of very advanced, again, in another place called Surang Tila, this is in Chhattisgarh. Again, we see the same earthquake proofing technology. A massive earthquake had hit this place but the temple did not collapse, okay? So, so this kind of technology was used while building the structures, okay? So we have evidence of uh, very advanced technology. Um, now, um, what, like, like I mentioned before, um, some of the temples, um, I, I want all of you to, kind of think of each temple as an ancient epic, like a Ramayana or a Mahabharata. The number of times you read it is going to change your perspective on the epic, okay? If you take a really profound text or a movie, for example, if you take a really profound movie or a text, the number of times you're going to rewatch is going to change your perspective. The temples were built with this kind of information. There, there are hidden codes in temples. There are secret codes, nobody has found them. Nobody, we don't look for the secret codes. One of the things that 
we we want people to do is we want people to go to temples and look for the secret codes hidden in temples. Now think about it, right? So when we go to a mall, you have an entrance sign, say enter, and you have an exit sign saying exit. So when you go to a mall or movie theater, you always have this. You go to a hotel, you'll see, okay, this is where you enter, this is where you exit. Even in smaller halls, you will have something like this. But in ancient temples, there's no such thing. There's nothing, right? You don't, you don't actually see enter or you don't see exit. And people try to complicate. They're saying, no, 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 we always enter via the ease, we exit via this, this, blah, blah, blah. But, and in smaller temples, that's okay. But actually ancient temples had so many mandapas. The, there were so many small sections. We don't know how to navigate through the temple. With, nobody tells us, okay, this is step one, this is step two. There's no actual guide to show us that. But it turns out, that they have entrance and exit symbols incorporated in the temples. In, in every ancient temple, you will see a mythical figure or quote unquote mythical figure called Yali or Vyala. Okay, the, the Vyalas are of multiple types. There are Simayali, Gajayali, et cetera, et cetera. But you will see them incorporated in the pillars. Okay, now if you, and this is the, the first time I, I think I, I'm, the, I'm the only one who found this, probably this science was lost for many hundreds of years. Okay, when you go to Dara's room, when you enter a temple, you'll see all the Yalis looking in a certain way, but there's one particular Yali that looks a certain way, pointing to the entrance. Okay, and you can go back to YouTube or you can, you can search online and find out. Again, you can see the exits also, the tails of the Yalis specifically pointing, saying, no, you, it's a waste of time for you to go anywhere. Just go here. It'll specifically show you. Again, in um, uh, Kailasanadar temple also, you'll see the Yali specifically pointing, saying, okay, go here. Okay, so they, but this science is forgotten. We, we don't look for these things today. We don't. Well, nobody's looking for these things today, okay? Again, with the sundials, in many temples, if you go, you will see these nice big chakras with spokes, okay? It'll be, it'll be fantastic. It'll have a lot of information. And for the longest time, people thought these were just ornamental things. These are just things that are supposed to look beautiful. No, most of the sundials you see, most of the chakras you see, are actually sundials, they are your clocks, okay? They are your clocks. You can go and you can, today, if you go to Konark, you can go put your finger in the sundial, you can put it in the chakra, and you can tell the time, like, okay, it's 2, 11 p.m., accurate to one minute. We're not talking about an approximate time, okay? We're, we're, today, the guides will take you and they'll just, they'll play with you like this, right? They'll say, no, no cell phones, no, blah, blah and they'll take you and they'll put the finger in the sundial and they say, okay, now the time is 2.12 p.m., right? And then they'll make you check your phone and it'll be exactly 2.12 p.m. because it's accurate down to one minute, okay? So these kind of informations are all hidden in ancient, um, ancient temples. Uh, again, in, in my uh, recent exploration, I went to uh, a temple in Bavka in Gujarat. Okay, this is a very old temple. It's almost ruined. In every carving, there will be one Devanagari letter. There'll be sometimes La, Om, Sri. There'll be like, like a, but you have to really look for it. Like you have to basically go very close and you have to analyze it. And there'll be a secret letter there. I don't know why. Okay, I don't know why yet that is. Like, we, but we will eventually find out like why they're doing those things. So there are many, uh, so that's what I mean. So when a person goes to worship God, so he goes into the temple, he worships God, he comes out. But if you're looking for science, if you're looking to find sundials, you can do that. If you're looking to find secret codes, you can do that. If even if you're looking, if you're interested in animals, if you're interested in animal behaviors, you can see, it'll, it's really interesting. The, the you'll see uh, things like a monkey riding on a goat, okay? 
but monkeys do that. We don't, we don't observe that in nature nowadays, right? Because we live like in such a closed manner, monkeys do that, right? And they actually ride goats like a horse sometimes. And they put that information in temples. So the temples has, have these amazing information carved inside them. So you can learn a lot from these, uh, from these temples, okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All of you make me do the dirty job. I have to go to remote places while you guys enjoy. <laughs> but, ah, yeah. Stegosaurus, yeah. Oh, you didn't see the. Oh, oh. Yeah. But we, I spent like two, three weeks in one temple, so I have to find it. <laughs> so I spent that much. So most people don't know this. Some of you may be like, how does he find these carvings, right? Because we go into a temple and we stay there, like our team, like we'll probably take four or five people and we'll stay in the temple for like two weeks. We try to document all the carvings of temples. It's a monumental job. It's a it's a big job. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, only when we studied Categorically, then we have seen all the carvings. Okay, so now uh, when we talk about this, um, there are not only secret codes hidden, guys. There's one thing I found which is really fascinating. I believe, and this is only a belief and I can be wrong. I believe that every temple has one moving part. Okay, and this is a big statement and I cannot prove this, but one of the classic examples in last year, I think maybe uh, 12 months ago or 15 months ago in Bangalore, uh, they found this in a temple called Ranganatha Swami temple. It's, it's, it's in the middle of the city in Bangalore. Okay, a lot of archeologists went to this temple after, after they found it. But the, the pillars are there and on top there is one circular stone. And it turns out that you can spin the stone like a tire, like almost a gear, like very slowly you can spin the stone, okay? Now they thought maybe the engineer made a mistake in one stone. No, they could rotate all the stones, the, those stones. Now we don't know how it's connected inside, okay? So after, now you know India, like now everybody just went and started to spin it for fun. So now they put concrete on everything except one. Okay, so this is one example. Again, in um, uh, Hampi, you know, you've seen the, the great chariot of Hampi. Uh, it's on the 50 rupee note. You, you guys may have seen this. It's fantastic, it's amazing. Uh, huh? Stone chariot. Ah, stone chariot, yeah. It's, it's, it's made completely out of stone. It's not a real chariot. It's made completely out of stone. It's ancient and it's really huge and it's on the 50 rupee note, but you can actually rotate the wheels. The wheels are movable. When we go and look at the axles, you can see that people were rotating this for a long time. And now um, there's some damage to it. Now the ASI has put concrete and put it, uh, especially I made a video about this. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but I said the wheels rotate. Then they put a big fence. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, sometimes it happens to me. <laughs> I some many times it's happened. Now I'll make a video and then they'll put a fence <laughs> around this because now everybody is going to go and rotate this. Okay, so but it's rotatable. We don't know why they did that. It doesn't make any sense, right? It's not going to move, at least as far as we know. So why put those moving parts in temples? Why do temples need moving parts? Only machines need moving parts. Why do? Why are they putting move, moving parts in temples? In Chhattisgarh recently, one uh, priest or pujari has found that the entire lingam is spinning. He didn't know this for a long time. He was just doing rituals. Then he found out that the entire lingam spins. We don't know why. Uh, in one, in uh, another ancient temple in Tamil Nadu, this is a temple called Uttra Kosamangai. There is a yali or a vyala and inside the mouth of the yali, there is a ball, okay? There is a stone ball. You can rotate it, you can roll it, you can move it, but you cannot pull it outside. 
okay? The standard explanation that we get is just, these are just ornamental things. We don't understand why such pains, right? We don't understand the, the thought process of the ancient builders to say, why did they go through such pains to carve these things? But nobody also knew, like this, this is lost technology, right? If you say, okay, this is fancy, then you would advertise this, right? You'd be like, okay, you can come here and you can spin this. You won't keep it a secret. Even the Pujari didn't know that the Lingam was spinning. We don't know why they were doing this. You understand? So th this is the kind of information that are hidden in, hidden in temples. Um, another uh, fascinating thing, said, uh, thing that we find in temples is the presence of a secret tunnel. Well, most of you know this. Most of you have definitely heard of this. There are secret tunnels inside the temples. Um, uh, one of the, again, uh, there is a place called Chandravali Caves in Karnataka. It's, a, it's, it's almost a labyrinth. They will not allow you to go into the underground cave without a guide. Because it's so complex, you can get lost and you will be stuck there. It's so large. It's, uh, it's near Chitradurga. Um, uh, again, another famous one. Uh, what's the largest treasure ever found? Padmanava Swami Temple, right? Now estimating 1 lakh crore, 10 lakh crore, 100 lakh crore. keeps on going. Where did they find it? Underground vaults. Okay, so what was the idea? Again, I, you know, we have to kind of think about like what they were doing with temples. The temples were not built with one dimension in mind. They were built for even things that we don't fully understand. Uh, recently in Gujarat, we have found um, a huge triangular underground tunnel that connects Raniki Val, Jasmal Nazi, and Modra Temple. You can go into Modra Sun Temple, and there's a place where there's an underground tunnel going. And we can literally trace the tunnels. And this is going for 100 miles. Now, if you Google what is the longest underground tunnel in the world, you will find the answer as the Gotthard Bay. This is maybe 35 miles or 40 miles or something like this. But 1,000 years ago, they had made a much longer tunnel in India underneath these temples, okay? So imagine the technology needed to create those things, okay? Even if you want to... I, uh, how many of you know that Elon Musk started this project called Boring? I don't know if you guys heard of that. Uh, Elon Musk started a project called Boring Project, okay? Because he got tired of the traffic in the streets because of the, uh, in the morning and in the evening, the cars are always stuck. So what Elon Musk started to do was Elon Musk envisioned a project saying that, no, we'll build massive tunnels going from one place to another. So this way we can eliminate the traffic problem. This, he called it the boring project, okay? It's, fun, it's a funny name. But now he has abandoned this project because he could not build the tunnel for more than like 10 miles. He was not able to build it because it's so difficult. So imagine how ancient builders would have built such a tunnel a thousand years ago. So I want you to kind of visualize were they really using primitive things? How did they manage to get lighting? How did they manage to get oxygen underneath in, in that long area? So, so I want you to kind of think about the technology that they should have used and their understanding of things, okay? Um, now, again, um, when we talk about history, we talk about things like, okay, there was an Indian civilization in India, right? And even in India, they'll talk about separate civilizations. They'll talk about Egyptian civilizations, They'll talk about Chinese civilizations. They'll talk about Greek civilization, all almost completely separate, completely not attached to one another. To, like all, all, almost like, because think about it, right? They argue that how could an Indian man have contacted the Greek man? It's too far, right? Even horses will not go. How could they, they kind of, they're completely disconnected, right? But when we look at the concept, you're talking about um, when we look at the carvings in Konark, okay? You'll see the carving of a giraffe, 
Okay. Oh, I, I don't know if many of you have gone there, but it's still there. Fortunately for us, you will see a giraffe. There's no doubt that this is a giraffe. This is one of the very few instances that archaeologists and historians are like, yeah, that is a giraffe. What can we do? Okay. But giraffes are only found in Africa. Okay. They're found in Central and South Africa. Okay. So either the sculptor must have gone to Africa or the giraffe must have come to India. Right? That's it. That's it. Oh, I mean, if, if there is another option, let me know. So how did such a connection exist? Okay, so how did such a connection, again, in Hoysal Isra temple, you can see the carving of an Egyptian. Okay, so how did, how did, how can a sculptor carve the Egyptian? Okay, and then uh, while we were documenting Bruhud Isra temple, um, this is a, one of the uh, famous temples in Tamil Nadu, the Bruhud Isra temple. It's a thousand years old. And uh, this is in 2013. Again, we were documenting each and every carving. We take a picture of the carving and we note it down. And then almost on the top of the tower, it's very hard to see. We're, back then we didn't use drones. So we were just zooming in with our cameras and you can see a European man. He's wearing a hat. Okay, and he's wearing a shirt, almost like he doesn't have a collar, but he's having a shirt and he has a pocket. And he's almost like posing for a picture. And then when I put it, of course, everybody went crazy at that time. When I, when I posted it saying that, look, how can a European man, it's clearly European, it's like a top hat with like a button shirt with a pocket, okay? So how could they have carved it a thousand years ago? Okay, so there was some connection there that we missed. Again, the carvings of Chinese found everywhere. Carvings of Chinese found Bhadisra temple all over Pallava structures. They just found everywhere. So there's some element that we miss, okay? So there seems to be some connection um, between the civilizations, okay? Around the world, I'm saying, because when I went to, Ma when I went to research the Mayans in Mexico, uh, when we listen to the Mayan language, which is almost gone now, because everybody's just speaking Spanish in Mexico, but when we listen to the Mayan language and see what, uh, how they're referring to each other, you'll be shocked because it's very close to Sanskrit language. It's very close. We don't know how, but it's very close to Sanskrit language. And it's funny because if, during exam times in Japan, okay, during, if, if the children are going for exams, okay, if they have to give a test, they go to a temple and worship a specific God called Benzaiten, okay, to pass the exam, to get good marks in the exam, okay? They're, mostly they're Buddhist now, uh, they worship nature called Shintoism, but they worship a God called Benzaiten. And the Benzaiten is really cool, right? It's a, it's a female, right? It's usually shown in white and it, show, it has a stringed instrument and it's sitting on a bird. It's goddess Saraswati. Okay, it just has a different name. It's called, and you can Google this and you can see it in Wikipedia. They just call it by a different name called Benzaitan. We don't know how they change the name and they accept, yeah, this is goddess Saraswati. It's the same, it's the same thing. Even the pictures we have of Saraswati is the same, okay? But they worship the God. Even remote places in Colombia, when we went to Colombia, Colombia is far away, guys. It takes, a long time to go to Colombia, uh, you know. Um, at least Peru is more touristic, but Colombia is, is kind of really remote. And because of this, um, Pablo Escobar. You, do you guys know Pablo Escobar? He was a big, uh, he was a big yeah. smuggler. Yeah, he was, he, was, he was a big smuggler. So Colombia was completely in the in the dark for like 20, 30 years. Nobody could go to Colombia. But when we went to Colombia, you can see an elephant god. And guess what? South America doesn't have elephants. And they're worshiping, I mean, they don't worship because they're all now, you know, Christians or communists or atheists. But when you look at the ancient carvings, you can see the elephant god. And when we, when we went deep into the pockets and we talked to the locals, and I've put this on video, the locals are actually say, yes, these, this is a Hindu god. Okay, we don't know how it's possible that this culture went all the way to Colombia 
Okay, that's that's really for. So we we and we, so we are missing some pieces of this culture that we are trying to we are trying to put the pieces together. But there are many holes in our theories. Okay, so so these are the um, um, so these are the things that um, that I wanted to talk about. And of course, I we find a lot of different carvings uh, in Hoysalesra Temple. We find we find carvings of things like a telescope, okay? Um, this is one thing that nobody could debunk because it's clearly a telescope. Uh, because if it looks like something else, people are like, no, 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 this is not that, right? This is something else. Because this, this, there's, uh, this is uh, 900 years or 1,000 years old, okay? So this guy's putting a telescope to his eye. He's closing one eye. He's opening this eye, and he's looking at the sky, okay? Uh, 900 years ago. What do historians say? When was telescope invented? It was invented by Galileo or Lippershe maybe 400, 500 years ago. So how can you put that carving 900 years ago? Nobody knows. Okay, nobody knows. So um, we find again and again and again, we find evidences. Um, recently in a temple that we went to, uh, this is a temple called Raniki Val, okay? This is an inverse temple. It goes into the ground. It's amazing. You guys, if you guys get a chance, go and visit this temple. It's almost an inverse temple because in a temple, you go slowly from the bottom, climb up. In, in Rani Kiva, you start from the ground level, you slowly go inside. Okay? And then in one of the carvings, there's a woman. She seems pregnant. And there's a guy putting a cylinder to her ear and listening like this, okay? Now, believe it or not, today we use the same technology. Um, not all of them use ultrasound. They will just use a cylinder to detect pregnancy. You can, you can just put a cylinder on a pregnant woman's belly and listen to the baby's heartbeat. And you can even say if the baby's healthy or not. So again, what do historians say? This was invented by Dr. Pinyard maybe 200, 300 years ago. But this carving again, 900 years old. So these carvings are literally rewriting history. Today, of course, there's going to be some period of time, right? Praveen Mohan is a pseudoscientist. Praveen Mohan is, uh, is just telling lies. The carvings are there. You all can go and see. I'm not making it through graphics or something like this. The carvings of telescope is there. The carving of the pinyard horn is there. You can go and take a look. Anybody can go take a look. But initially, we're going to ruffle some feathers. Initially, there's going to be some friction because the world would like us to believe that somehow 2,000 years ago, there was no civilization. Okay, we were all kind of like, very barbaric, but that doesn't make any sense, right? So initially there's going to be some friction, but eventually already happening right now, because they, again, you have to understand, they found a place called Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, that's 12,000 years old. And they're looking at megalithic structures. They're looking at big temple-like structures. And people did not think that that could exist 3,000 years ago. Okay, so they're already extending the timeline saying that, oh yeah, you know, we did have temples 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 years ago. Okay, so I want you all to kind of have an open mind and then look at the temples in a completely different way. Okay, I think I've given a somewhat of a, how long did I talk? Maybe a half hour? An hour? <laughs> I think I'm ready to be a politician now. <laughs> I didn't know this hour passed. <laughs> Okay, so let me conclude, okay? Let me conclude. And um, I was told that when I conclude, I could sell you something because many people do. Usually they will sell their books, right? I wrote this book, buy this book, or I'd be like, I, I did this meditation course, buy this, or I could be like, I sell this product, buy this. I'm not that smart. I don't have anything to sell to any of you, okay? I'm not trying to sell you anything, um, but I would like one thing from you is that this information, the, the task of decoding ancient temples is too much to be done by just one person. 
It cannot be done by just Praveen Mohan or like 10 people, okay? A lot more people like you have to come in independently. I'm not saying that you should join us or as volunteers. I'm saying independently, when you go to temples, most of you, at least, you may have thought of, I'm going to go to the temple and close my eyes. This time, of course, you have to close your eyes and pray to God. That's, you know, that's what I do too. But I also want you to open your eyes and look at the information in the temples, look at the carvings in the temples. And if you find something interesting, share it with others. Like we, are, we have literally created a trend where we are posting carvings on a daily basis, multiple carvings around, you know, and we're spreading this to everywhere to raise awareness about our culture, okay? Okay, guys, all right, thank you. Mm -hmm.